Good day, and uh, thank you all for taking time from busy schedules to join uh, join us once again for a Global Performance Excellence webinar uh, offered uh, by uh, the Institute of Industrial and Systems Engineers. Um, today, we're going to focus on integrated Lean Sigma, uh, and the specific focus is on um, me sharing learnings, lessons, tips uh, on how to train it and how to, to do it. Um, we have uh, three sponsors today, uh, the Poirier Group, uh, a group that I'm uh, affiliated with, I work with, uh, Morsteam.com out of Columbus, Ohio, a group that I've worked with for uh, over 15 years, and uh, Dell Technologies. Uh, so we're pleased to have Dell be a sponsor today. Um, so a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, thanks for joining us. We'll uh, share uh, how to get access to the recording, presentation, YouTube versions, uh, and blogs, and so forth at the, at the during the webinar, actually. Safe is going to be chatting links to you periodically. Uh, Use the chat function to share your comments and questions, and uh, both Safe and I'll be uh, reviewing those as we go along, and and we'll weave uh, weave things into to my presentation. Um, as as is always the case, follow up questions are welcome. Contact information is provided uh, at the end of the presentation, and for those who value certificates or participation and want to get your CEU credits, IILC will be mailing those out. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about the Dell partnership with IISC. Uh, these are some of the features and functionalities of the partnership that that Dell has with IISC. Some advantages for uh, you as an individual or you as a member of an organization. Um, if you scan that, uh, you will uh, it will take you to a site which will tell you more about. Uh, how you can take advantage of these benefits um, with this partnership between Dell and IISC. So I, I'd encourage you to do that. Obviously, Lean Sigma requires great computing power, and, and Dell uh, is obviously a leader in the field of creating uh, great software and hardware that help us do our work as uh, industrial and systems engineers. So, um, I'm going to tee up, I'm going to summarize what I've learned as it relates to how do you train integrated lean segment, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how you actually, uh, some things that I've learned about doing projects once as you're training or after you've done the training. And at the end, I'll close out and talk a little bit about what's, what's ahead in terms of upcoming webinars, as well as the spring conference that, that will be held in New Orleans this year. Just a note, there's a lot of slides in this deck. I wanted to include more slides rather than less sl slides for you. Um, I'm going to skim through some of them. I'm just going to be hitting on highlights, so bear with me uh, as I um, as I work to make sure that I'm sharing the right things with you, and and um, at the same time give you some real really good food matter to work with uh, once you access the slides themselves. So just some quick background. Um, you know, what, why am I uh, sharing learnings and lessons and tips with you about integrated Lean Sigma? Uh, I spent the last 15 years from 2004 to, to 2020 um, really um, focusing almost primarily on, uh, on integrated Lean Sigma, how to, uh, to build, design, develop, uh, deploy an OPEX program that included Lean Sigma training, Lean Sigma certification and and then uh, business process improvement projects at at a global life science company called MDS. I, I highlight some of the things that we achieved in that three years that I was with them as, as vice president of business process improvement and then uh, went back into academia uh, with Julie Heigl at Ohio State and um, uh, I was the director of the Integrated Lean Sigma Certification Program for, for ISC in the department there at OSU um, and trained a bunch of, bunch of uh, young bachelor's degrees in industrial and systems engineers uh, at the black belt and green belt level. And then we did uh, two semester capstone senior design projects. So 
<clears throat> lots of uh, most almost all of the things that I'll be sharing with you come from from those experiences. Um, I wanted to remind you that back in early 2022, we did uh, we did a two-part series on integrated lean sigma. You can access uh, those uh, two webinars and presentations with that link there. Uh, you will get an email tomorrow from me via Zoom uh, and um, um, how to get to this presentation and the recording will be shared with you again tomorrow in the post uh, webinar email that you get. Um, so when you go to the IRC website, you'll see a landing page that looks something like this. And we've bucketed the, the post webinars, past webinars into categories. So this particular webinar will be an integrated Lean Sigma bucket. Uh, and uh, SAFE has, uh, I think SAFE has shared uh, the link specifically to that, that particular bucket. You can see the other webinars that we've got, got in there. Um, so once you get to that integrated Lean Sigma page, you'll see that those two webinars that I mentioned, the integrated Lean Sigma part two, the integrated Lean Sigma part one there, that, that top arrow, and then uh, another thing I want to make sure you're aware of is that we did a webinar, and I don't know the exact date, but that second arrow down there, uh, teaching lean, proven best practices for transactional processes. Um, we we did a we did a webinar, uh, and we talked about um, how do you teach lean, and um, it was a great webinar. We had two or three people on a panel with me. Um, so I would encourage you to uh, to also make availability, uh, take take advantage of uh, of that webinar. These the webinars are on demand. They're a service provided by IISE, uh, mostly for our members, but customers have access to them also. And then again, I, I throw this page up. This is the operational and organizational uh, excellence folder. But you can see lots of webinars in there, and many of them relate to the topic that we'll be talking about today. So let's let's get right into uh, now summarizing, talking a little bit about some of the things that I've learned about uh, training, coaching, teaching uh, integrated Lean Sigma. So I've got six main points that I want to cover off with you. Um, some of them I'll spend more time on than others. But the first one is that I think establishing the context for integrated Lean Sigma and, um, and OpEx uh, is, is important. Um, so at Ohio State, the context was, was sort of as depicted on this slide. When I came to Ohio State, Julie Heigel, who is the department chair said, you know, I've got young people that like our courses but they don't understand how the courses all fit together. So I'd like you to create an integrated Lean Sigma certification program that's the capstone for them and that really helps them understand how everything comes together. And what I saw with students back, this would be in 2007, is uh, from a personal mastery perspective and a professional mastery perspective, they were smart, they were bright, they were obviously in engineering, they were at a great university. <clears throat> But they had some tendencies and habits that I thought weren't going to serve them. So when we built the Lean Sigma training program at Ohio State, we wanted to not just impact what they know about uh, Lean and Six Sigma. We also wanted to impact um, when they came out of school, uh, how good were they at change leadership and change management? Were they were they uh, professionally developed and ready to hit the ground running? So there was a there was more than just teaching them Lean Sigma, there was also blending in improving their personal and professional mastery. And so the, this slide represented the, 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 uh, the focus of the training or the, I would say the framework for the training that, that I did both at MDS and at Ohio State. Um, you know, I sort of, I listened to Jim Collins talk one, one time downtown Toronto and the word greatness kept coming out uh, and the greatness in discipline, the relationship between discipline and great uh, kept coming out as a major theme in everything that he said. And so I got to thinking about, okay, greatness is a lot about disciplined people and thought, word, and deed. Well, what are they disciplined about? And then I sort of put Peter Senge together with Jim Collins 
and Peter Senge said, we got five disciplines. And if you're disciplined in those five things, then you're going to achieve full potential performance. If you're less than skillful in those five things, then you're, you're going to underperform. So the, le the box on the left is, is what we were doing with integrated lean sigma, teaching people the domestic methodology, teaching people how to uh, use the tools um, associated with the domestic methodology, walk through the roadmap. But then we also wanted to augment it with what we call personal mastery mental model, building shared visions and team learning. At MDS, the context, so that was the context at Ohio State with, uh, with the students. Uh, at, at MDS, the context was a little different. You've got practicing professionals um, in their 30s, 40s, 50s that you're training to become process improvement specialists. We had a business that was underperforming. Um, I characterized the business in the box on the left and what, what we were what we were intent on doing in the three years that I was there was you know con converting businesses that are underperforming to con to businesses that are uh, focused focused improvements and all uh, for the of uh, the business units and and performing at the levels that we needed them to, to perform at and so we were we were really more about uh, creating a, a team of business process improvement professionals that could manage this migration path from the way it was in 2003 to the way we wanted and needed it to be in 2007. So we sat down and we developed um, a Y as a function of X program uh, focus. We said, hey, this is, this is how much uh, hard benefits we want to get from our OpEx program. So we're going to create a BPI team. We're going to invest some money in that team. We want to return on that investment. So we we had a pretty clear understanding of what the CEO and the board uh, wanted and needed from the BPI uh, team uh, in terms of us facilitating um, aggressive direct benefit improvement throughout the business. And so we said, well, what are the things that we have to do in order to create uh, more enterprise value for the business? And we came up with these, these factors that you see on the, on the right-hand side. So Y is a function of X. Achieving a great OpEx program, achieving the greatness that Jim Collins talked about, good to great, going from good to great, uh, requires that you have an equation, you've got a formula, and these are the factors that we got to manage. So we, we went about doing that. And so... One of the things we did right out of the bat was we, we created like a SharePoint site. And so everybody in the company could go to the SharePoint site and they could see um, what, what's this thing called integrated lean signal all about? What, what's this thing called OpEx all about? And how can I get engaged? And how can I get involved? And uh, what's, what's happening with this program? So we created a, almost an intranet SharePoint site that uh, really help people understand the, the reason why we were doing the program and what were the objectives and key results that we were setting out to, to accomplish. The CEO um, would go around and do town hall meetings throughout the company, 50, 5,500 people, and um, he positioned OPEX. These are the four planks. These are sort of his four strategic thrusts, so to speak. Uh, that he he came with when they when the board brought him in to transform the the company, and you can see OpEx is a is a plank in his platform, so to speak, and so um, he became a really important salesperson for the business process improvement work that I was charged with designing and setting up and doing. So the the objective was to grow enterprise value and we conceptually thought of enterprise value as the number of customers that we've got the the amount of money they spend with us and the dur durability of the relationship the stickiness of the relationship we realized that we wanted integrated lean sigma we wanted our business process improvement team and our project to be focused on driving growing the cube and we realized that we wanted Lean Sigma and OpEx to impact all aspects of the business. So we didn't just, just want to focus on manufacturing or finance or 
or back office. We wanted to focus on everything in the business. So we really created a very pervasive uh, footprint, so to speak, for industrial and systems engineering and integrated Lean Sigma. And we really focused on improving the process by which the company positions itself in the marketplace, the process by which it exchanges value with suppliers, customers, employees, and then the traditional OPEX stuff, how do we improve operations? How do we improve quality, efficiency, productivity, and so forth? So we, uh, we created an infrastructure. This is the context for training, training the belt, so to speak. Uh, we created an infrastructure where we had, uh, for example, we, we added value stream owners. The business had never had value stream owners. They had never thought about cross-functional value streams. It was, uh, it was a business, sort of a typical traditional business where the functions were sort of the, 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 the verticals and the verticals were sort of stove pipes, meaning they were, it were somewhat insulated and there wasn't a lot of communication and coordination in some cases across value streams, cross-functionally. So we created value streams, we introduced, we defined what a value stream was, we got people to think of, we got the business units and the functions to define what they were and then assign ownership for them. Uh, and that was a really, really big um, decision, choice on our part to push that. Uh, it was a little risky because not a lot of people do it or did it, but uh, it really accelerated things for us because we, we got people to screw their heads on a little bit differently around the way they think about the flow of value in the organization. So uh, those are examples of, uh, we, I spent probably uh, six, six months doing white belt training sessions, two day white belt training sessions with, we had uh, four revenue generating business units and we had uh, seven functions, uh, IT, finance, HR, and so forth. Um, and we took the top 20 to 30 people from each of those units, and we did a two-day white belt uh, session where we actually did a, a, a lean simulation, physical simulation with them, and exposed them to the language and the concepts, and, um, and then helped them start to launch uh, them thinking about how they were going to deploy uh, integrated Lean Sigma and OpEx uh, in, their, in their units. So that was uh, that was sort of six months of foundation laying where we socialized what we were doing, why it was important, and uh, really got the CEO's direct reports uh, on the same sheet of music. That was very important. Um, <clears throat> I think many times uh, we start to go up and we just start training belts and we have them start doing projects and we really haven't laid the foundation for the work that they're going to do. There's not there's not the context hasn't been set. Uh, and so I think that that's important. That first step is important. I think the second thing that we did, uh, as if you follow those those boxes at the top from left to right, we, we wanted to make sure that we were engaging the right people. So we um, we were very picky. We were exclusive, not inclusive. You know, it wasn't one of these things where, hey, 5,500 people, who wants to be a belt? Who wants us to spend $25,000 making you a green belt or a black belt? We, we didn't do it that way. We really went out to the, to the supervisors and the managers and we said, pick the people <clears throat> who have a natural appetite, who have an appetite, but who also have a natural talent for this. And so we actually did some testing and um, we wanted to know how do these people think and how do they behave? And, um, and then as we started to get experience, get test results, and we, people started doing projects, we were correlating how effective they were at producing results on their projects in relationship to the test scores. And we started to navigate and we started to understand the relationship between this instrument and um, <clears throat> people's um, the, the, uh, the ability for people to produce results with their Lean Sigma projects. That was very helpful for us uh, in making sure that we were picking the right people for this particular seat in the bus, this seat called a process improvement specialist. <clears throat> so there's a, there's a staffing, <clears throat> there's a staffing um, 
that's got to be on your radar screen, I guess, my point. I think a lot of times people just say, hey, who wants to do it? And if somebody raises their hand, we put them in. Well, they might not have any aptitude for it. And so then we end up spending a lot of money on somebody and they get out and they really can't do the projects and they don't produce results. And then we are sort of in a bad situation for them and for us. So the <clears throat> so that's the, the who, um, who before what, right? That's what Jim Collins said. So we do the who, then we do the what, the curriculum. And so um, <clears throat> I spent a lot of time in 2003 and 2004 doing my homework and um, and benchmarking and finding out what's out there in terms of, of uh, training. Now, obviously training's come a long way since then, um, but um, but back then it was, uh, it was, there was a lot of death by PowerPoint training. So, you know, people had these sets of slides and you go through the, the define stage and you'd look at 935 slides the master black belt clicking the slide projector and uh, you know you, your eyes rolled to the back of your head and that was the way a lot of the training was so very rapidly um after i'd gone through two or three sessions of death by powerpoint uh i stumbled and well it really wasn't a stumble i said stumble but it wasn't a stumble i i found i purposely found more steam bill hathaway and more steam and um and Bill had been had built and has continued to build and improve and evolve um, what I would call a blended learning curriculum. And um, <clears throat> it's online, it's self-paced, you self-pace, self-managing. And so we really, we literally abandoned the death by PowerPoint approach and we went to this online web-based curriculum um, that's got lots of features and functionalities. People love it and it, it comes to life. And so starting in 2005, we switched from the original uh, training program that we had uh, and migrated to, to more Steam's training. And, I, and then I continued to use more Steam's training the, uh, the 13 years I was at Ohio State. This is, the, this is basically a textbook we used. Uh, and we wrapped a lot of things around it. But so from a training standpoint, <clears throat> I've, I think I've probably done 50, cla 50 classes, probably conservative estimate. Um, this was my choice and still is my choice. Um, and so what we wanted to do at the training is we wanted people to understand um, what is the Lean Six Sigma roadmap? Now this is again, this is the integration of Lean and Six Sigma. So, you know, way, way back, you had Six Sigma roadmap, you had a Lean roadmap, and they were they were different, understandably. Um, most people train integrated lean segment. They sort of blend those things together, and we did that starting in 2004, 2005. <clears throat> and so, what we're wanting to do is get pe train people in the roadmap, the tools, the steps, the steps in the process, the steps in the roadmap, the tools, um, and then show them how the application of that roadmap against process problems uh, can drive enterprise value. And this thing that you can't read on the right, but, but that, is a, uh, that is the Deloitte enterprise value map. And so we, we always wanted the students to understand how is what you're learning about doing to make going to causally drive value in the enterprise. That was a critical exercise that we taught people to think think through and be able to present to their senior stakeholders because <clears throat> if you can't do that then then you got nothing right you're just doing a bunch of projects and you're just using some some fancy tools so the other thing that we do in the training is we want to make sure that people <clears throat> understand the difference between you know continuous improvement breakthrough improvement and then big breakthrough improvement so the way to think about it is think through Low hanging fruit, you know, quick wins, think through Kaizen events, think through sprints, think through Demaic, and then, then think through design for Lean Sigma. <clears throat> um, DC DOV, define concept design, op, detail design, optimize, and, and, uh, <clears throat> and verify. So, all of that, <clears throat> all of this work, all this training and work is aimed at growing franchise value, growing the cube. 
uh, growing the number of customers, customer relationships, growing the value that we get from those customers, and then growing the stickiness of the relationship. We, um, in, the, in the training, we, we, spent, uh, a, we spent a lot of time, uh, we integrated, we developed and integrated uh, what I would call four labs, four physical simulations, four labs, four hands-on, you know, roll your sleeves up, work with people. And these are the four labs that we, we designed and integrated. So I would, um, one of the learnings and suggestions I would uh, provide to you is physical and computer-based simulations are essential to ensuring that the student can <clears throat> this is uh, the Bloom taxonomy. So what, what we want the students to do is we want the students to be able to <clears throat> make the transition from remembering things, understanding things, then starting to learn how to apply things, and then, uh, in other words, reduce things to practice, reduce tools to practice. So failure mode effect analysis, what is it? Do you remember what it is? How do you do it? What's the left side versus the right side? What does a countermeasure mean? Then start to get them to practice, you know, okay, let's just do one, right? So let's take a little, so these labs and simulations are opportunities for people to start to practice in a low risk sort of situation, practice with applying some of these tools. So we use ProdSim or Stickerbrick, that's our lean lab. <clears throat> The, there's a there's a recording I showed you earlier that talks a little bit about that that simulation. Statapult, uh, Air Academy is an example of a company that sells the Statapult itself. That's a great great little lab that that can help uh, you teach and train process capability analysis, measurement systems analysis, design of experiments, and and more. Um, these are usually one day labs, <laughs> and then we had a change leadership and management lab that was a little more focused on soft skills. And then at the end of the class, <clears throat> at the end of the training, we uh, we use what Morstein's, uh, sig what they call Sigma Brew simulation, which is um, an online simulation. And it really walks people through the DMAIC method methodology step by step by step. And they actually get to do a project with this simulation. Um, so that's sort of the capstone lab experience. So these simulations <clears throat> um, are balanced and, and I think the right number of things that, again, help people make this transition from um, learning about, going through a course, learning about uh, the DMAIC methodology, for example, what are the tools you use and define? What are the tools you use and measure and so forth? Um, and really start to, to venture into, okay, now I'm gonna apply it. Now I'm gonna really do it. <clears throat> so IISE has partnered with Morsteam. And, um, and so if you're interested in finding out more about the partnership and, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the partnership and um, and how IISC uh, with with Morstein can help you um, develop some of these training ideas that I'm talking about. Uh, feel free to reach out reach out to James Swisher and his contact information is down there. And uh, if you go to that link that I provided on the right there, it'll tell you more about the partnership between IISC and Morstein. So let's let's migrate into the the next step. So that's sort of some 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 sharings on curriculum. Um, you know, what do we teach? What's the textbook? How do we wrap things around the the core curriculum? Um, so then the next fo focus is on okay, how do we actually do the training? Sort of the pedagogy associated with uh, the training. And I'm going to talk through briefly those six bullets. Um, so I think. First and foremost, um, 
what, when I started this, this endeavor at, at uh, MDS in 2003, 2004, and we early out, we had a, a consulting company that we brought in to launch the program, to help us launch the program and start to do the training. We had a bunch of master black belts running around, uh, running these classes. It was a fairly traditional, you know, college class. It was, again, it was, <clears throat> we're in a room. There, there were some simulations, there were some engagement activities, but it still looked an awful lot like a college class where the professor's up in front lecturing and the students sitting out there listening and taking notes or whatever. So <clears throat> I think what what Bill Hathaway and, and Morstein sort of got me thinking about was, and I didn't even know the term flipped classroom back then. I hadn't even heard the term. I don't know when the, the term flipped classroom came into being, but um, what, what we were really doing was we really were flipping the classroom and we were, so we were doing a lot of, you know, so what, what we do with Morstein is that people will study um, a, a section of the material so maybe all the modules on define, and then we'll come to then then we'll uh, then we'll come to class, and we'll we'll have some exercises. So so I don't have to I don't have to teach them the content because they're self learning the content, which is the way kids learn and people learn today anyhow. So they're really learning the language, they're learning the words, they're learning the tools. What we can do then when we come together physically is we can be practicing, reducing the practice. So we can be not doing level one and two of Bloom's taxonomy. We can be migrating into level three and helping people understand how they apply this stuff, how they make this stuff work. <clears throat> and then when they leave class, they, if they're in the real world, like when we were at MDS, people were doing their certification projects concurrently with the training. So when they leave class, then they're out actually applying what they studied before class, practice during practice when they were it together in class, and then they're reducing it to practice, they're applying it on their projects. So that's sort of the way it worked. And uh, <clears throat> it was a much more, a much better method in uh, at MDS with with you know practicing professionals, and I think it worked really well with students, um, in, in juniors and seniors in industrial engineering. So an example of uh, what you do when people come together is we did a lot of teach to learn stuff, and the, the whole purpose of having people get up and and teach other people what they've learned is to, to help the, the the concept is that we learn the most by teaching it we, we learn the most we don't we don't learn that much by just listening <clears throat> so can we get people more active in the learning process by having them stand up and teach now the watch out here and this is why when we did the teach to learn session i walked around and i and i looked at what they were putting on flip charts or whiteboards and I made sure I did QA, because if we teach the wrong thing, if people are teaching something wrong, then that's not a good thing. So we have to make sure that you do some QA on the teach to learn stuff. But generally, that's pretty easy to do, and, and it, it becomes a, a natural part of that teach to learn process. And that's the role that a master black belt or an instructor or whatever has in the training, is to be able to make sure that people aren't uh, interpreting things incorrectly. So we 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 relied heavily on Morstein. It was literally the, the foundational textbook, and so um, but we augmented Morstein with uh, things like uh, Fifth Discipline, <clears throat> the Lean Sigma Pocket Toolbook, which I I really like, and students like that. The Lean Sig Six Sigma Mini Tab. Book over on the right, the orange thing. It's probably green or blue now. They change the color with every edition. Um, as you can see, we used Minitab. Uh, Minitab uh, uh, pretty well immersed in universities. Uh, we used Minitab at at, um, at MDS also. 
uh, Morsteam had an alternative to Minitab uh, called Engine Room. And uh, you can learn more about that if you go to that link that I provided uh, for you uh, in the partnership with IILT and, and uh, Morsing. I'm going to skip through that. One thing I wanted to highlight is uh, in, in the when I, was, when I was at MDS and we were doing a training, we, we probably put 25 groups of 20, 20 to 25 people through, uh, through the training and, and got people certified. Um, when we first started out, uh, and we and we enrolled people in Morseem and they started going and we sort of gave them a, a syllabus. So we gave them a schedule. Uh, what we found was that <clears throat> people were not, um, uh, they, they weren't being self-disciplined around making sure that they they kept up. And so we in, in, uh, invented something we call a training day. And we got that approved by the, the powers to be, <clears throat> their, their supervisors in particular. And once a week, uh, we blocked off Thursday. And everybody that was in the course, everybody that was in the cohort, the training cohort, um, we knew that they were going to be in uh, one room <clears throat> and they were going to be 100% dedicated to studying more STEAM uh, and or working on their project. And um, at periodic points throughout that day, uh, we would we would get on um, a Zoom call or a Microsoft Teams call, and all the students would get together and they and we'd have an open forum where they would ask questions. <laughs> so if we were studying session two point three and Morstein, and somebody says I don't understand this term we'd pull more steam up 2.3 and we'd look at it and we'd, we'd talk it through. So I had a couple of master black belts that were working with me that, that helped facilitate these, these sessions. And um, I think <clears throat> in the real world and even with, with students, um, unless, you <clears throat> unless you have something like this, I don't think that you can keep, keep pace. I don't think that you can ensure that people are going to stay synchronized. That if you got 25 people, they're all going to stay sort of reasonably lockstep in terms of where they're at. And if you don't do that, then what happens is <clears throat> you're teaching something that a bunch of people are way, way, way far back. <clears throat> so um, I don't know whether I'm communicating this real clearly, but I think it's dedicating some some time for uh, the students so that they've carved out the time uh, and uh, and and then we can interact with them and ask questions. Uh, that's that's important, I found. <clears throat> the other thing that I wanted to highlight is that <clears throat> one thing that Morstein does that's that's really great is uh, they have um, <clears throat> this is a, a screenshot from the material. And up in the upper right hand corner there, you see that that uh, target target picture with the arrow in the center. That That's a symbol, that's an icon that rep represents learning objectives. So whenever you see that, if you click on it, those are the learning objectives for this particular lesson. And then they've got that submarine, which reflects deeper dive. They've got case studies, they got practice exercises, they got formulas, they got videos, they got data sets to practice with, and so forth. So <clears throat> this is a very uh, interactive uh, courseware. And what what happens is you find that students like to take shortcuts. So they see these things pop up like a deeper dive and they'll just skip over it. <clears throat> so they'll just read the stuff that's on the page skip over the deeper dive and then go to the end, take the quiz, they're done with the quiz and they think they're done with the session. So what we had, to, what we found is that we had to keep reminding them, you got a final exam at the end of this thing, it's five hours long, it's 120 questions. It's very comprehensive, it's very challenging. And um, if you don't do the deeper dives, you're gonna have a hard time passing the exam. So my point is, 
sometimes you got to work with the students. And even we found this even at MDS where we had 35, 40 year old people, they would want to take shortcuts. They'd want to take the, the you know, the, 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 the skip stuff. And that it's important that they not do that with the training. <clears throat> so at Ohio State, the, it looked sort of like this. We had, we had some lectures, we had quizzes, we had interactive exercises, simulations, simulated processes, and then we had actual project co coaching work. So the 5810 you see there, that's the Black Belt Foundation course that more steam is the, the core training component. And then 58, 11, and 12, you see in the upper right-hand corner, that's the Capsule Senior Design Project. So that's where they're actually doing their project over a two-semester period to prove that they can apply the things that they learned in 5810 in the foundation course. So that's sort of the, the OSU version of the training. <clears throat> and I would, again, just highlight that the simulations, uh, the simulations are really, really critical. So I would, um, I think many times the training is online training, web-based training, no physical simulations, um, just really a, a uh, subpar um, uh, developmental educational uh, uh, program, in my, in my opinion. So if you think about, you know, for a bachelor's degree in industrial engineering, they got all these courses they're taking in the fall and the spring. Typically people would take 5810 in the spring of their junior year, and then their fall and spring of their senior year, they do the capstone certification. So that's how the training and certification played out in, uh, in academia. And of course, one of the things that we wanted to do, because Julie Heigl said, you know, kids don't see how the courses come together. So we put this slide together to say, hey, here's the courses you're taking, and here's how the things that you learn in those courses fits into the DMAIC methodology. So we literally map tools and principles and methods that they were getting in their core curriculum in industrial engineering to, uh, to, the, to the roadmap, so to speak. And, um, you know, we had, um, uh, again, the, the the components of the training that we did, both at MDS and at Ohio State, were really personal and professional mastery, systems and statistical thinking. That's the core of the stuff that's in Morstein. Really pragmatic modeling of prop problems and projects was another component that we did during the 58, 11, and 12 course. And then, you know, for a student, the opportunity to be able to add an integrated Lean Sigma certification to your bachelor's degree was, was a big deal, made a difference. Um, it, it did make a difference in terms of kids finding jobs, great jobs, the jobs they wanted. And fortunately, being in Columbus, we had our, a wealth of, of companies that we could draw upon from different industries. So life sciences, uh, retail and food processing, financial, financial and other transactional, and then production manufacturing and process industry. So these were, their capstone senior design projects were, they were like 0.3 FTE assigned to the client. It was like an unpaid internship basically. And they could put it on their resume that way. And they actually had to produce results or they didn't get certified. So it was a great, great opportunity to, um, uh, to do that. In, in, uh, at MDS, it's uh, it's a little different. It's the same basic model, based training model, except that the project it's not sequential in that you do 5810 and then you do the capstone project. The project was actually happening concurrent with the training, and that was good because when we did get together physically, the teams did get together physically. We had an opportunity to be um, to 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 use their projects. Uh, as part of the conversations we had in the in the get together session, so they would be studying more steam, and then they'd come into the class, and we'd be having really great focused conversations on reduction to practice. How do you make this work? And we could use the the projects that everybody's working on uh, as real life real life case examples. So it worked out really really well. In both cases, uh, the training and the certification uh, takes about five months. That's the, the lead time, typical, typical lead time, which I think is, I, I think it's a good investment of time for, for 
most companies. So uh, let's see, I'm gonna skip through some stuff here. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here that drills down a little bit more on the actual courses, the roadmaps, the difference between the six, six Sigma and Lean. Again, this is all material that I put in here for your benefit. I want to switch now to a conversation around, okay, so we talked a little bit about the training, the training program, what it looked like in MDS and industry, what it looked like at Ohio State and academia. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the certifying, just very little about the certifying thing. So, so um, one thing that I, I didn't, didn't uh, do is uh, there is a black belt body of knowledge that has been, uh, ASQ has their version. Um, the Fisher School of Business, College of Business at Ohio State and Morstein put together their version. And um, I, what we did, uh, what we did at MDS was we took that body of knowledge document and we made it a self-assessment tool. So the, the things that you have to know and be able to do <clears throat> for each step of the domestic methodology are listed out in an Excel spreadsheet. And then you, you meaning the candidate, assesses where they're at in terms of Bloom's taxonomy. So I, 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 could, I could teach it. I know it well enough to teach it. Um, I've done it once. Uh, I'm really good at doing it. So it's that kind of a scale. So where are you relative to, you know, mastering some topic, say design of experiments or failure mode effect analysis or root cause analysis. And so if you're interested in that Excel uh, tool, I'd be glad to send it to you. Uh, just, just reach out and let me know and I can, I can send a copy. I didn't put that in here, but, but um, the reason I bring it up is because I would have the students do the assessment several times as they were going through the training. And uh, the, when you're done with the assessment, you come out with a score that's a scale on a scale of zero to 100. And kids would come out with, uh, you know, they haven't even done their project yet and they come out, they're an 84. And so I'd go back to them and I'd say, you guys are an 84, I'm a 72. And I've been doing this for 15 years. <laughs> so. There's a little bit of halo effect that takes place. You know, people don't really understand the difference between a three, what a three and a two is, or a three and a four or whatever. So as part of the exercise is to get people to be realistic about <clears throat> what it means to master something, to, to really be good at reducing something to practice. The other thing I'd say is that there's a difference between a certificate and certification. Many providers today are not honest in relationship to this distinction. So I would encourage you to be wary. And if you have a program, make sure that you understand the difference between what it means to be have a certificate, taken the course, passed the exam versus taking the course, passed the exam and done one or more projects and proven that you can actually do this stuff. So my, my, my analogy is that most of us wouldn't fly with a person calling themselves a pilot who only passed the VFR pi private pilots exam and hadn't successfully soloed and gotten at least 40 to 50 hours of training flight time with a certified flight instructor. So that's, that's the metaphor, right? I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think of getting in an airplane with somebody unless they really had earned their pilot's license, which e.g. pilot's license certification. So now let's talk quickly about this deploying. So the doing. <clears throat> so I think the, one of the questions is, as we start to migrate from teaching, training to doing, is picking the right projects. Um, so uh, how do we pick the right projects? And and uh, I got some thoughts on that that I'll run through quickly. So this. You know, if you think about it as a funnel and you've got this idea hopper on to the left of the idea hopper is uh, <clears throat> it could be voice of customer. So the customer saying things that drives the project it could be employees are sent feeling pain. Employees are frustrated with something. So the employees call for a project. 
could be a workout or a Kaizen event or a value stream or flow workshop, or it could just be data and facts about the process. How's the process performing? <clears throat> or it could be voice of business. So the business says, we need this. I don't know how to, we, we need, we've got a performance gap. Translate that to processes that are causing that performance gap and fix the processes, right? So fundamentally, <clears throat> picking the right project is, is balancing, is figuring out how you balance the portfolio in terms of the source, where it's coming from. And so <clears throat> at, um, at MDS, we, we focused in all the units, we focused on making sure that we had the right percentage or the right breakdown of direct benefits, projects that we're gonna create direct benefits versus projects that we're gonna create new capability. And I would call them enabler projects versus projects that were pain points, felt, felt pain, uh, driven by felt pain versus projects that had uh, other benefits, some form of other benefits. So you think about Lean Sigma project, you think about direct benefits, impact the profit and loss statement, indirect benefits, impact the balance sheet, and then other benefits, um, <clears throat> safety, quality of work life, um, you know, things that are important, but, but you can't, it's not easy to track them to the balance sheet or the profit and loss statement. So, my point is we we were systematic in thinking through our portfolio. We knew what the portfolio looked like, and we uh, we evaluated and assessed how each of the functions and units were doing against a number of key result areas. So how good are you guys at picking the right projects? So it was, it was simple back then, it was a simple color coded thing. How well are you doing with training? How well are you doing with coaching? How productive are your belts? So these are examples of things that we had that we put together infrastructurally to make sure that the doing part of the training, that we were we were creating the, the return on the training, the investment. We were getting the return on the investment that we put into uh, the training. <clears throat> we used um, uh, more steams traction. At MDS, we used... Uh, a uh, program tracking system called uh, Enterprise Track. It was, I don't know who uh, that that application still is around, but I think Cisco acquired Instantis. Um, I used Morstein's traction at OSU. It was a great project tracking uh, and it gave us a lot of visibility. So we knew exactly what projects were in flight, were they ahead of schedule, behind schedule and so forth. So. Something something like this is uh, is useful, is valuable, and so much easier to do in 2023 than it was in in 2003. The the other thing I'll say about the the doing the uh, you know some tips on being successful at uh, doing the project and and running a program uh, with a whole bunch of projects in flight at the same point period in time is uh, really getting the students to understand uh, the difference between <clears throat> uh, a deliverable you create in a project, new capability you create, outcomes that occur as a result of new capabilities, and then how those outcomes translate to intermediate benefits, in-game benefits, and then how those <clears throat> support the, the enterprise's strategic objectives. This slide is busy, but it's powerful because so often we find that the students would say, my objective is to build a simulation model so that we can do this. And I go, uh, okay, what's the so what? So you've built a simulation model, you've simulated the process, you've proven you can do that, you've, you've applied a tool, but, and you've delivered that, but how does that manifest itself in terms of, of direct, indirect, or other benefits? Tell me the rest of the story. So <clears throat> this picture is really an important part of the tail end of the training that you give people, and as you're doing the project, 
to force people to think through causally, how are we, how are our projects creating enterprise value? How are they manifesting? How are benefits manifesting themselves? And are they manifesting themselves fast enough? Are we realizing the benefits fast enough? So when it's all said and done, um, this is an example. We, <clears throat> this was an example of uh, our pharma services revenue generating business unit. And this was back in 2006, 2007. And so <clears throat> we actually, had a deployment leader, my counterpart in pharma services was a woman named Joan out in Lincoln, Nebraska. And she ran, she was the deployment leader for this business unit. And these were the divisions in the business unit. And so she had 25 projects in flight <clears throat> across all the divisions. And we, we essentially created challenge budgets for them and uh, so this is an example, I'll just give you an example. And then we kept track over time of uh, the number of in-flight uh, domain projects, the number of workouts. We kept track of, uh, we had a directional five-year plan where we were headed with the, if you aggregate all this training, all these projects that are happening as a result of the training and you put the business cases, you add up all those business cases, what does it look like at the enterprise level? This was our five-year vision that we created. I, uh, I left in uh, the fall of uh, 20, 2007. So um, um, I, and I, I believe that 08, 09, 10 uh, looked pretty much the way we, we mapped it out. I think they were, they stayed on that, that trajectory. So if you, do, if you do everything we talked about today, and I know I rushed through things, but you you can get these kinds of results for a business, and um, this this made a, a huge difference in the business. Um, <clears throat> and I think this is really an example of uh, what what we all aspire to when we create when we're part of an opex or a business process improvement uh, team. So in summary, uh, we covered uh, six things, <clears throat> and I sort of. Um, summarized with just a short statement. So the, the instrumentality of business process improvement has to be established and bought into by the top 100. So that's what I mean when I say establishing context. Um, I would never start training a bunch of process improvement specialists in this unless I knew that, um, you, you know, that the senior execs understood what we were doing, why we were doing, how important it was. And then picking the right people to be part of your, your efforts and your team is important. And don't settle for less. Pick, pick great curriculum. Uh, I never regretted uh, migrating to Morstein back in 2005. And uh, I've been using it ever since. It's a, it's a great, great curriculum. Um, <clears throat> don't fixate on the certification. You know, the certification is a piece of paper. It's what results that they can create. And the certifying, again, can be the booby prize, basically. It's not the piece of paper. It's the knowledge, behaviors, and skills, ultimately, the results you can create with teams of people. So if you're going to do certification, that's great. And I think it's important. A lot of people value that. It's important on a resume, but make sure it, it means something. <clears throat> and then I think from a deployment standpoint, doing standpoint, teaching people how to become creation skillful and lead teams that can become more creation skillful and be disciplined with integrated master planning and really be good at the control stage, the back end of the projects to make sure that there's sustainability. Those are the things that really make a big difference uh, on, the, on the back end of the training and the, and the, and the project. <clears throat> so I know I rushed through that. Feel free to reach out if you have questions. We've got um, Flex coming up March 28th. Uh, Eduardo Toledo is a VP quality and OPEX. They've been doing uh, OPEX for 20, over 20 years. So he's going to tell your story about what they've done and what they've learned. And then on April 11th, Jared Frederici, one of my colleagues, one of my students at Ohio State, is going to join us and talk about principal strategies, methods for systematically reducing waste and costs from your organization. That's a big deal in 2023. And then we got more stuff coming up in, in, uh, in Q2 in uh, April and May. So that's Eduardo's 
Um, Safe says some of these links might not work, Will, but he's been posting posting things to you. Uh, this is Jared's uh, webinar that's upcoming. Wanted to uh, <clears throat> uh, make sure and put a pitch in for the IISC annual conference. Uh, I'll be there. I'm looking forward to it. My first IISC conference was in New Orleans uh, many years ago. I won't tell you how long. Um, but the Council on Industrial and Systems Engineers is putting together a, a track of uh, three great sessions on, uh, actually five great sessions on Sunday, um, the first day of the conference. And um, really in, encourage you to, to consider coming down and spending some time. And um, if you do, we'll hook up and say hi and, and, uh, and chat. Um, so this is a great, great event that happens every year. Last year was in Seattle. It was a wonderful experience. <clears throat> and finally, uh, there is a survey. Uh, thank you for taking time to participate in this today. Uh, give, us, give us some feedback. Tell us how we did. Tell us what we can do better. Tell us what you'd like us to see develop for you going forward in the future. And as always, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Safe. <clears throat> Take care, guys. Bye.